recording this on the cloud. <coughs> and let's continue our discussion yesterday. So yesterday we were looking at what I referred to as limits at infinity. So taking the limit, but instead of the x approaching some finite number, x <coughs> is approaching infinity. And as I sort of indicated yesterday, um, we're not going to spend a lot of time in terms of learning to find <coughs> these limits. They are real limits. I mentioned this yesterday, but they're harder to find than other limits because one property that we might use to find other limits that we cannot use here, we can't talk about continuity at infinity. Um, infinity is not a number. F of infinity is not a coherent thing to write on the board. So there's no talk about the limit being found by taking infinity and plugging it in. We will learn one trick, but before we do that, I'm going to be using <coughs> Despos here just to estimate some limits for now. I'd like to try to motivate this a little. When do these limits at infinity <coughs> occur? And the, well, they occur a lot. Um, the most concrete and easy to understand way that these limits happen is if your variable is time, t, and you're trying to predict the future. And you don't want to qualify what you mean by the future. You don't want to talk explicitly about what's going to happen in one year or 10 years or a hundred years. You just want to talk kind of generically about what's going to happen in the future. Now, to investigate this mathematically, we can do that with a limit. If t is time, then as time goes to infinity, we're going further and further and further into the future. So that's a pretty classic example. Speaking of classic examples, in medicine, you often, if you're using math to model a situation, you often get functions that look like this. Some number times t divided by t squared plus another number. And in particular, 
This is a pretty classic way of modeling drug concentration. How much of a drug is in a patient system T hours after the drug was administered? And of course, the details of this particular function, the 36 and the 12, would depend on all sorts of things. The drug, the sex of the patient, the body weight of the patient, all sorts of things. But often you do end up with equations that look kind of like this. And you can ask a natural question. What happens to the drug in the future? I mean, hopefully we can intuit to the answer to that. Hopefully the drug concentration is getting smaller and smaller as time passes. You would not want to give a patient a drug that just sits in their body forever. But this can be investigated mathematically by taking the limit as the number of hours goes to infinity. And since we haven't learned any tricks for taking these limits yet, I'm going to just investigate this in a kind of In formal fashion, I'm going to let me see. I'm sorry, this mouse is running out of batteries and it's fighting with me. Eventually, I'm going to go to desmos.com. Let me share that so my online student can see it too. Go to the graphing calculator, and we're looking at C of T equals 36 T divided by T squared plus 12. And of course, time has to be positive. So let's restrict ourselves to the first quadrant here. We see about what we presumably expect to see. Um, the concentration initially arises as the drug disperses through the body. Eventually, it stops to rise and starts to fall. And presumably, it's falling specifically to zero. But let's create a table here, T C of T. Huh. Okay, Desmos, we'll do this if our variable was named X. It doesn't seem to like these T's. So let's change our variable name to make Desmos happy here. And now we can ask what the concentration is after, let's say, 24 hours. And it's, this is percent 
per liter, I believe. So 1.469% per liter. Let me do some quick arithmetic. One week would be 168 hours. So that's, oof, sorry, the spouse is really fighting me. Let's look at 168. And after one week, the drug concentration has fallen to about two, sorry, 0.2 percent. After one month, after one month, good heavens. After one month, about 0 0.05%. Let's look. Finally, after one year. And you can see that these numbers are sort of sinking down to zero. This does eventually stop being accurate. I mean, presumably at some point, the drug is just completely flushed out of your system. Is it really true that after one year, you've got a drug concentration of 0.004%? Possibly not. But for smaller values of, well, for smaller values of X now, um, functions that look like this can be quite accurate. And it is predicting in the long term what we would expect it to predict. It is predicting that this drug concentration is sinking down to zero. Let me get back to the whiteboard. Let me move this so that it's not covering stuff up. We do see that. As another example, we could try to predict the amount of pollution in a lake as time passes. And this example is maybe more interesting because we don't have necessarily a lot of intuition about this, but maybe we can try to generate some kind of intuition. Um, absent, you know, serious cleanup efforts, lakes are presumably going to get more polluted over time. But what we don't see, or we hopefully don't see, is pollution just totally getting out of control and going up to infinity. I mean, what's probably happening as time passes is that the amount of pollutant in a lake is hitting some kind of constant finite number where cleanup efforts and pollutants are kind of balancing each other out. So that's what we might expect to see. Let's let T be the number of years in the future. And that's that P of T be the amount 
the amount of pollution our units here are probably nothing any of most of us have heard of, but formazin turbidity units. And a realistic function might look something like this. A of t equals 4.25 times t to the one fourth power plus 5 divided by 5 times t to the one fourth. And let's ask ourselves the same kind of question we asked with drug concentration. What's going to happen in the future? And again, we don't want to quantify what we mean by the future. We don't want to ask specifically what's going to happen in a month or a year. We just want to ask sort of generically as time passes, what will the amount of pollutant in the lake do? And this is the situation where this is a situation where you'd take the limit as time goes to infinity. You can think of infinite um, sort of time getting bigger and bigger and bigger as time passes. And time to fight this mouse again. Once again, we're going to just look at this look at this graphically, since we haven't learned any algebraic techniques for studying these limits. A of t equals 4.25 times t to the 1 4 plus 5 divided by five times t to the one fourth. And, ah, no, I, even though I knew that Desmos won't like this variable t, I still made that mistake. Here we are. So, Actually, this situation is different from what I was picturing. Instead of the lake getting more polluted, this particular function represents some kind of cleanup operation, and the lake is getting less polluted. But, oh, there was a thing stuck to the mouse. I just needed to tear it off. Um, the lake is getting less polluted as time passes, but unfortunately the pollutant isn't going down to zero. It's not becoming completely clean. Instead, it gets to about 1.2 something, it looks like, and sits there. And if we turn the C of X into the table, the A of X, here's 
the future. X is years now, so these numbers are suddenly very arbitrary. I mean, 24 years in the future, 8,760 years in the future. But it seems to be going down to about 0.95 or maybe 0.9, somewhere around there. It's approaching, can no longer see this. It's approaching some constant number. It's not going to zero, unfortunately, but it's not going out of control to infinity. It's just staying around point one something. Um, you're also seeing, by the way, a disadvantage of trying to approximate these limits numerically which is that at some point rounding error kicks in, but okay, we're pretty, pretty happy with this approximation. This is unfathomably far into the future. And at this point, adding more zeros doesn't seem to be changing there. Up to rounding error, we're at 0.85. So that looks like a good guess for the limit. It's a little caught off guard by that. I didn't realize how big X would have to get before it settled down. Another application of the um, of the limit as x goes to infinity or as t goes to infinity. Well, I say another. It's basically the same application. It's just that you can find examples of this where our variable is in time. So as an example where you might want to do this with a variable other than time, let's look at the following. Let's look at the focal length of the I. So you're looking at something, if that something moves towards you or far away from you, the focal length of your eye changes to keep the object in focus. And the focal length of the eye is measured in millimeters. And it depends, again, on the distance of the object that you're looking at. And the particular formula, of course, this is approximation, but the focal length is f of d equals 25. Missing a d up there, I'm almost certain. 25d divided by 25 plus d. So I'm using d as my variable because we don't have time here. We have distance and Distance is also being measured in millimeters. Now, taking a lap into allowance, say, the curvature of the Earth, you can see a great distance. Like if you're on a flat 
pain on a clear day. You can see something like four miles. Let's ask ourselves, what is the focal length when you're looking at a very distant object. Well, there's sort of two ways we could approach this problem. One way we could approach this problem is we could explicitly define what we mean by distant. We could say four miles is distant. Then we could convert four miles into millimeters. Then we could plug that into the equation. A slightly less formal, but maybe easier way to approach this problem is as a limit problem. You're measuring D in millimeters, remember. These units are really small. Four miles is an absolutely huge number of millimeters. So instead of doing any conversions, let's ask ourselves, well, What's the focal length to do as a D goes off to infinity? At the moment, this might not seem much easier or easier at all than converting four miles to millimeters and plugging that into the equation. But where, in fact, this class period, we're going to learn how to take limits that look like this very quickly. We're going to just be able to look at this and say, as an object that's further away, the focal length approaches 25. But since we're not there yet, let's verify that I'm not blowing smoke with that 25. If Desmos didn't like T, I assume it's not going to like D either. So let's go F of X equals 25X divided by 25 plus X. And here's X, that's kill with that very vast entry here is f of x. And 25, which I gave as the limit, certainly seems plausible. We could look at some bigger values of x. Here's 10,000. Here's a hundred thousand, here's a million. And it certainly looks as if as X is getting bigger, F of X is approaching 25. So it does look like that's what the focal length is doing as the object is moving further and further away. This seems to be what's happening. And now, for now, the only trick we're going to learn to find these limits at infinity, we will eventually 
either late this semester or early next semester, learn Lobatow's rule, which is the normal method for tackling these limits. But for now, we're going to learn one trick. For finding limits of rational functions. Remember that a rational function is a polynomial divided by a polynomial. Let's learn to take the limit as x goes to infinity of a rational function. Uh, well, before we do, I've sort of been nattering on. Does anybody have any questions about what's come before? Then let's look at this a minute. Um, this limit might not exist, first of all. I mean, all limits might not exist, but let's make this explicit. It's very easy to build functions such that the limit as x goes to infinity of that function does not exist. Like, This is not a rational function, but the limit as x goes to infinity of the exponential function doesn't exist. And the limit as x goes, in fact, the limit as x goes to infinity of any of the six trig functions doesn't exist because instead of settling down and approaching some number, the trig functions all bounce around. So you see that in the table as X gets big, the sign, for example, is just bouncing around kind of at random. Uh, limit as x goes to infinity of x squared doesn't exist. So it's actually pretty special for this limit to exist. And rational functions are one of the kind of standard functions that often do have limits as x goes to infinity. But even then, they don't have to. x squared plus x plus one divided by x. This is a rational function. You look at this table as x goes to infinity, f of x goes to infinity. But if I change this rational function, suddenly a limit does exist. X plus one over X is rational. This limit certainly from the table looks as if it ought to be one. So these limits we're looking for might or might not exist. And the trick is the same whether the limit exists or it doesn't. And the trick is based on the following. It's based on the fact that the limit as x goes to infinity of some number k, any number k, divided by x 
raised to any positive number. This limit is always zero. We can investigate that. We can go back to Desmos and we can, these sort of random numbers are starting to bother me. Let's pick slightly more natural numbers to go into our table. We can look at, for example, two divided by x to the third. And we see if these do go to zero very quickly. Remember that a negative exponent is scientific notation. It's telling you to move the decimal place to the left. So two times 10 to the ninth is point zero, 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 two. It's very close to zero. If we turn this three into a point four, well, now it seems like it's taking longer but as these numbers get bigger and bigger, this fraction is going, let me move this so you can see the number, this fraction is going to zero. It's taking a little longer, but it is happening. A point zero, 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 five by the time x is whatever this is. Um, let's see. And, and again, if we turn this to a 5, this to a 1.2, doesn't affect anything. If we made this a negative number, negative 5, still going to 0. So all of these limits are approaching zero. And that's because x to the any positive number is going to infinity. And if you have a number negative five and you divide it by a very large number, the result is very small. With that observation in our toolkit, we can state the trick for dealing with these rational functions. It's to divide both the numerator and the denominator by the largest power that is appearing. in the rational expression. I'll do an example, and then it's been a while, but I'll have you do an example. The example one, let's find the limit as x goes to infinity of 2x squared plus x cubed minus x divided by x cubed 
plus one. According to what I have written down here, we should look for the largest power. So what are we raising x to? We've got an x to the second, x to the third, x to the first, x to the third again. The largest power here is three. So this trick, which sort of requires a lot of writing, but most students don't seem to find it all that difficult, is to divide the numerator by x cubed and the denominator by x cubed. And we're not changing the fraction because we're doing the same thing to both the numerator and the denominator. It's like we could multiply the top by two and the bottom by two. That wouldn't change anything. Here we're doing something a little more intricate, but we're doing it to both the top and the bottom, and we're not changing these fractions. Give me some, I don't want to erase the whole bar, just wanted to give myself a little more space. And now if you have addition and subtraction over something, so in this case over x cubed, you can break that up. That is to say, the top of this big fraction is 2x squared divided by x cubed plus x cubed divided by x cubed minus x divided by x cubed. And the bottom of this big fraction is x cubed divided by x cubed plus one over x cubed. And now because of space reasons, I'm going to start erasing and rewriting stuff. Does everybody have this in their notes that wants it in their notes? x cubed divided by x cubed appears twice. It appears here and it appears there. And anything divided by itself is one. So x cubed divided by x cubed is one. And likewise, down here x cubed divided by x cubed is one. x divided by x cubed is one over x squared. We have partial cancellation. This x to the first, this x cubed partially cancel. and give one over x squared. x squared divided by x cubed, looking at that 
term there, that x squared and that x cubed partially cancel. And we're left with two divided by x. And now we hit this with what I said here. This part of that frame that the limit of any number over x to a power is zero. So you see, we're taking this limit. 2 over x to the first goes to 0. The constant 1 goes to 1. 1 over x squared goes to 0. The constant 1 goes to 1. 1 over x cubed goes to 0. And when the dust clears, we're left with one over one as our limit. And you might, you might already sort of know how to take the limits of rational functions. Uh, tomorrow, I mean, we're very close to finished with this section, but tomorrow we'll tie this into horizontal asymptotes, which you've probably seen at some point in some algebra class. But for now, why don't you do an example for me? And The student who's joined me online, um, hi, first of all. But um, I'm going to just have my class do this problem. I'm going to walk around. I mean, my in-class students do this problem. I'm going to walk around, see what they do. Um, the class for you, I would say, is over. I mean, you can do this example too, but I'm not in a position where I can look at your work and comment on it. So perhaps I'll see you tomorrow or some other days. Why don't you find this limit? for me, and I'm going to end the recording with this.